good morning. Welcome to the physics video lecture. That's physics 2A, video lecture 31. We're starting a new chapter. And that is fluid mechanics, chapter nine. And we'll have to start out with some new concepts. But it'll be broken down into fluid statics and fluid dynamics in the next couple of lectures. And uh, that's common to what we've been doing. We've had statics and dynamics. So fluid mechanics, we're taking fluids as, first of all, let's talk about the states of matter briefly. Because you know there are solids, liquids, gases, and plasmas. So we've been working with solids. but we have not yet talked about the physics of liquids and gases. So liquid gas and plasma, which is a little more exotic. But let's put, um, talk about liquids and gases. Those both are referred to as fluids. So we could have the motion of air. That's a fluid motion. We could have the motion of water. That's also a fluid motion. Good. So to begin with, we have to characterize something that, you know, can now take any shape. You know, you can fill the same liquid in different shapes of bottles and beakers. And so we need the concept of density. Make sure that's where I'm going to start. Yeah. So we have to begin with the concept of density. And that is, it's right there, clearly. Density, that's defined as mass per volume. <clears throat> so you could have a very tiny bit of water, you could have a whole bucket of water, a whole ocean of water, but then we take a certain mass divided by a certain dense um, volume that you get the density of that substance. So since we're using our standard units, we will go ahead and use the Greek letter rho. There's a new Greek letter for it, rho, not p. Okay, but you see how I drew it? And that's mass per volume. We always want the units here, so that would be kilograms per cubic meter. Cubic meter, of course, is an enormous amount of fluid under some circumstances. And there are other ways of looking at this, but we'll just use our standard definitions here. Kilograms per cubic meter. That's the density. And a very useful consequence of this is that we can define a mass as a density times a volume just by cross multiplying. So let's give some examples of densities. If your book will have more, you can make a whole table of them. I'm just going to put a couple here. Maybe the most important one is the density of water, which is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. Okay. And as we'll see, not too long from now, but as we actually already know, things that are less dense will float on water, and things that are more dense than this will sink in water, okay? We'll do that more formally. So we've got the density of water. The density of mercury plays a role. I have a demonstration, maybe I'll bring it next time, but um, we have mercury, which is a liquid metal, liquid at room temperature, will easily have a steel ball floating on it. Okay, so the density of mercury is 1.36 times 10 to the 4 kilograms per meters cubed. So if you ponder that a moment, that's 
13,600 kilograms per cubic meter, which is to say 13.6 times as dense as water. Density of steel, you guys should look this up. I'm just going to put a big approximation here. It's somewhere on the order of 7,000. Maybe it's more. Look it up. Kilograms per meter cube. I can write approximately and that absolves me. So, but steel is much less dense than mercury and so a, a steel ball will actually float on mercury half, pretty much half out. And I'll give one more density of air. Yes, air is a fluid. Um, and so at the room temperature state of air, we've got about 1.3 kilograms per cubic meter. Okay, so quite a bit less than water. On the other hand, still you've got yourself a cubic meter of air and 1.3 kilograms is a fist-sized piece of steel, so that's interesting. Okay, so those are some characteristic densities and you could have a much greater, a much larger table than this. Leave some room in your notes, put in some more if you want. You'll find them in your book. That's it with different things. Um, good. So we have density and now we need the concept also of pressure. I should be numbering these things. So density with one. I'll number it. I'm just going to number things. Okay. The next thing we need is the concept of pressure. That will be the letter P. And it is force per unit area. So pressure is force per area. The units of pressure are therefore units of force divided by units of area, which is newtons per square meter. And that is called the Pascal in honor of someone named Pascal who worked on these things. Okay, so that's past, those are the units of pressure, the Pascal. And so force per unit area allows us to, to produce enormous pressures um, without that much force. So let me give you a quick example to, to make this concrete. So we'll actually start with a solid. We're not using a fluid example. Our example is that we have a nail here. I'll draw a large spike. Okay, there's a nail. And there's some substrate, wood, metal, what have you. And we put one kilogram on that nail and it's under gravity, influence of gravity. So what is the pressure going to be down here? What's the pressure, that tip of that nail there? So, okay, G is pointing down. So now let's go ahead and construct what the pressure is. We know that we have one kilogram times G. So I'm going to write one kilogram, 10, meters per second squared, because I'm liking some simple numbers here. G is approximately 10. Okay. And, well, let's go ahead and write out the formula first, so we'll put the numbers in. So yeah, we're looking at M, G, divided by that area. And that's just the area of the tip of the nail. So we'll have one kilogram We'll just say 10 meters per second squared. So what's the area of the tip of a nail or the tip of a, of a pen or some sharp implement? 
Well, I'm going to say it's a sharp nail, and we have one tenth of a meat of a millimeter. So a tenth of a millimeter is 10 to the minus 4 meters, because this is a needle. This is more like a needle and not like some nail, okay? But I want it to be sharper than a millimeter. We're going to go to a tenth of a millimeter, 10 to the minus 4 meters. And we're going to square that, and now what do we get here? We get 10 to the first power up here, but we get 8 powers in the denominator to bring up to the numerator. Okay, So we're going to have 10 to the 9 all told, ask out. And it turns out this is very close to the strength of materials, greater than some, less than others, but this is why one kilogram on this sharp needle will actually put a dent in wood and other things, will actually drive it part way into wood. Okay. So these are enormous pressures. Okay. Now we're going to compare them to other pressures. So that was the needle, um, 10 to the 9, so we'll just hold on to that. Okay, my other example would be somebody standing in stiletto heels. So they have maybe a, a half a centimeter, okay, a half a centimeter square. Okay, don't draw, don't ask me to draw a stick figure, but there's a shoe here with a very sharp point. Okay. And now the pressure, okay, high heels. Okay, now what's the pressure? It's, it's again going to be mg over area. But let's say the mass is 50 kilograms, okay, 50 kilograms. We've got, ten, not nine, we've got 10 meters per second squared, and the area now is a half of a centimeter, so it will be 0.5 times 10 to the minus 2 meters squared. So now we got to work that out. We have 5 times 10 to the uh, 2 divided by 0.5 times 10 to the minus 2, that would be 5 times 10 to the minus 3. And we have to square that, and we're going to have 5 over 25 times 10 to the 2 plus 6 is 8. So that's 0 0.2 times 10, 2 times 10 to the 7, okay. 2 times 10 to the 7 Pascal, take some time and check that, I'm pretty sure I got it right. Point is, it's about 1 one hundredth of that, so it's still enough to put a little divot in your hardwood floor, maybe, if you're not careful, but it's not enough to puncture your skin, okay. So the pressures are on these these uh, magnitudes if you're actually bearing down on something. We'll talk about fluid pressures in a moment, but this gave us a couple of examples. Okay. So the next pressure we have to deal with is atmospheric pressure. Now the atmospheric pressure is a fluid pressure. Thing because here we are swimming around in our atmosphere and we're not feeling any pressure. Okay. So to get a demonstration of atmospheric pressure, you have to look at suction cups. 
I'll bring those next time since I don't have the demonstrations in here right now. So suction cups, and you know, I'm going to put them in scare quotes because who knows how they work, how the suction cups work. Well, that will become manifest now. So to actually measure the atmospheric pressure and not just, you know, you press a suction cup on something and you have to pull hard to get it off. You may be wondering why that happens. So let's um, talk about barometric uh, pressure. This here is a demo in quotes because it's an idealized demo. I'm just going to take you through a couple of ideas. So here's what is done. You take a capillary. I'll do this in steps. So you got a long tube. Step one is you fill it with a fluid. It's got a red pen here. You fill it all the way to the top. Fill, fill the tube. Oops, that's a B. Fill the tube with fluid. Tube with fluid. You'll see in a moment, it can't just be any old fluid, but for the moment we'll fill it with some fluid. And the second step is to invert. You invert this thing, put your thumb over it. Put it upside down. Okay, so this were a tube filled with fluid. You put your finger over the top, upend it, and put it in a dish of that self-same fluid. So invert and put it in. Here's a dish. Here is our capillary, our tube, and we have fluid here and all the way up except it doesn't go all the way to the top. What we'll find is there is a vacuum. So this is, remember it was full, okay? But now we've inverted it into this dish of that same, same fluid. And there's a vacuum left in the top. We'll note that vacuum. Why is that? The idea is this. There is a force caused by the atmospheric pressure and it's pressing down on the fluid and it's equal to the force of the weight of that column of fluid. That's why it doesn't just flow out all the way. Okay. So we have atmospheric pressure. The suction cup demos tell us there's something going on there. Atmospheric pressure. Okay. And that's going to be equal to the pressure of the weight of that column. So atmospheric pressure equals pressure due to the weight of the column. And now I'm going to give the game away. That's the fluid is mercury. Okay. Doesn't have to be mercury, but we'll see why mercury in a moment. So the column of fluid. And we just gave examples of how that pressure is determined. It's the weight of someone standing on their high heel. Okay, in this case, it's the weight of the column. And I'm going to go ahead and erase this. So the pressure is force per area. So if we'll write this this way, we'll write force, the weight of the force is equal pressure times area. And that's the area of that little capillary. 
So that's P atmospheric times A is equal to the density of the fluid, density times volume. So that's A times the height of that fluid. Let's go ahead and give an H right here. So A times H is a volume. Density times volume times G. And so now if we know what these density of this fluid is and what the height of that column is, we're going to get the pressure. So out of this we have P atmosphere is equal to, because A cancels there, uh, density times H times G. So A cancels. And this happens to be mercury. So it's, do I have those numbers? Do it the other way around. Okay. So there's the atmospheric pressure formula. And if you call this a barometer, which is what it is, then as the atmospheric pressure changes, this column will move up and down slightly, okay? And that'll measure the atmospheric pressure in its slight variations. So the standard atmospheric pressure, the atmosphere is equal to 1.01 .01 times 10 to the 5 Pascal. So again, we have relations here between these pressures that, you know, enormous pressure. And the density of mercury was already up on the board. So then you can figure out that H is going to be on the order of close to a meter. Okay, so a mercury barometer has to have this scale in order to function right. Okay, yeah, but so one more. Once more, we have the atmospheric pressure and it's the same at that surface level here. I should kind of point that out. At this level, the atmospheric pressure is pushing down and the column of uh, mercury also pushes down like that. Good. Yeah, so there's an interesting problem. Once you have this formula here, you can say, well, what if instead of mercury we use water? Or, and I think in the problem set it's red wine, okay? If you use some normal liquid close to water, you're gonna find you're gonna need an enormous uh, height of that barometer on the order of 10 meters because mercury is so dense you can keep it down to about a meter. So yeah, this is a really important uh, discussion right here. Okay. Yeah, and I think I'll assign that, but the answer is kind of on the board. Let me go ahead and fill that in for us. So the column of fluid, whatever it is, is just solved by that. So H is equal to P atmosphere divided by density of our fluid times G. In fact, it's worth doing the numbers right here in terms of water. So because these numbers are so good, you've got 10 to the 5 divided by 10 to the 3, divided by 10 to the 1, okay, so that gives you 10 meters. Okay. 10 to the 5 divided by 10 to the 4. So the, the water barometer would be on the order of 10 meters high. So a mercury barometer is you know, on the order of a meter. Okay, good, we have that in the homework assignment. You can review that again. Okay, let's consult the clock here.
Okay, so this is the basis of fluid statics. We need one more idea here, and that's called Pascal's principle. And that is that pressure exerted on a fluid is transmitted throughout the fluid uniformly. is transmitted throughout a fluid. And I can give a, a hydraulics example just to make it concrete right away. That's a whole subject for the engineers. But imagine you have communicating pipes here. So you have a horizontal pipe and coming up on this side, you have a smaller diameter pipe here. So we're going to have a fluid, how about a blue on this time, filling this entire pipe here. And then we're going to press on this with cylinders on both sides. press on this with a cylinder here. Okay. We've got a smaller one here. Now the idea is the idea is if I press down on this side, this side goes up and vice versa. But the pressure is the same at these two levels here. So P and pressure here are the same. Okay. Now we have pressure is force per area. So the force is the pressure times the area. I already wrote that out once. Force is pressure times area. And this means that for this uh, situation, let's go ahead and label this. This is one, and this is two. Now these cylinders clearly have different cross-sectional areas. P sub one, A sub one, P sub two, A sub two. So we have F1. See, since the pressure is the same everywhere, we have F1 is equal to a sub 1 and F2 is equal to P A sub 2. So because of the same pressure, if I press down with a certain force on this side, I get a certain force up on this side and vice versa. Now let's, let's draw the conclusion on this. Go ahead and erase this right here. And we'll put this in a box. We're going to have F1 divided by F2. So what do we get? P cancels equals A1 divided by A2. So this is one form of it. And to make it maybe more clear, if you see which one is larger, okay, so this one side is larger in this case. F1 is A1 over A2 times F2. In either case, we can look at this as a sort of a mechanical advantage, or literally it's a mechanical advantage. Let's go ahead and focus on this one right here. just like the law of the lever. If I press down over here, on you know, F2 down on this side, then I'm going to have to press down farther in order to make this thing go up. If I want to, you know, depending on the relative sizes, I'm going to have to press down, say, five times as far to get this thing to go up an increment. But I'm going to have that advantage as the ratio of the areas. 
So if the area here is 10 times as great as the area on the right side, then that force over here is 10 times as great as the force that I exerted here. So this is mechanical advantage and all of your heavy construction equipment that runs with hydraulics is making use of this. Um, yeah. So much for that. We may have a little assignment for that, but it's a really basic relation. And uh, you see it on one or the other. It comes from the fact that the pressure is the same throughout this fluid. The areas are different. Okay. I want to get one more topic in here. Yeah, we got this. So now we're going to go back to we'll make use of Pascal's principle. I'm going to go back to a scenario like this and get the pressure and depth formula. Now anybody who's been swimming in a swimming pool and dives down in the deep end feels that pressure on their ears where it starts to hurt. And so the pressure increases as you go deeper and deeper. So that's our next goal is to derive that formula on which we'll then base our other hydrostatics material. So let's call this the pressure depth formula. And it'll almost just be a reworking of the barometric situation. But let's go ahead and take a scenario where we have a beaker and we have atmospheric pressure up at the surface of the water here. And the question is, what's the pressure at a depth H beneath the surface? So right at the surface and immediately under it, it's the atmospheric pressure. But we have gravity acting on the fluid. And so there's the weight of the column of water. And what we can do is just imagine a column of water because the water's not moving, it's static. And we can ask, what is the force acting on that column of water? We could also imagine um, we also mad, imagine an actual object in here, maybe encase the water in a little membrane so it's an actual little mass of water. If we did that, we'd say, okay, then the external force acts at the center of mass. So we've got a force down. Um, how about my... I'm going to make my forces red this time. So we got a force down. We've got a force due to the pressure. And then we've got a force pushing up. And those are equaling each other. So in the down direction, we have minus P atmosphere times area. And in the down direction, we have minus mg. And in the up direction, we have the pressure that we're looking for times area equals zero. So that's the net force. Remember, pressure times area equals force. So we do one more step here. We have, well, we'll do two steps. We have pressure times area equals, just bring this over. Um, atmosphere times area plus mg. So again, that's the pressure down at that depth equals the atmosphere area 
and now our mass is density times volume, so that's density of the fluid times area times H, density times volume times G. Area cancels, and we've got our solution here. We have for the pressure depth formula, P is equal to atmospheric pressure plus rho G H. Okay. Pretty basic. Kind of the same discussion that we had with the barometer, but we have the atmospheric pressure on top, adding to it. And if instead of an atmospheric pressure, we had a closed cylinder we could push down on some piston, then that would be whatever pressure we are exerting. So instead of atmosphere, we'll just say P0, meaning whatever is pressing down on top, plus, which is usually the atmosphere, but plus rho GH. So that's the density of the fluid GH. And you can see what the pressure is going to be if we're floating around in free fall, say we go up to the space shuttle or something, then there would be zero gravitational acceleration. There would be no pressure. So it depends on G, the density, and the depth. Yeah, it's pretty useful. So I think we'll leave it there for now and do the buoyancy formula next time. These things actually... Now let's do the buoyancy formula now. These are all variations on the same theme. So we'll get the buoyancy formula and then we'll do a little bit of work with that. depth formula and we'll use that to get the buoyancy force. Okay, so the buoyancy force is something everybody's experienced. If you take, say, a soccer ball or something and push it under a pool of water, it's pushing back. You feel it pushing back. If you release it, it'll just come rising to the surface. So that is the buoyancy force. You're actually feeling it if you try to submerge something underwater and you feel the force pushing back. Okay. So to get the magnitude of the buoyancy force, we'll do our beaker experiment again. We've got G pointing down, we've got a beaker full of fluid. Okay, there's a fluid line. And we just have an object, we can make it for simplicity just a square type of object, <clears throat> some kind of box there, and we ask what are the forces acting on this box. Okay. Now it has its weight, we already talked about that in the sense of the water, but this time it's an, it's an object, and what we're going to find or what we see is that the forces due to the pressures pushing on the side will cancel each other, that's why this thing could just be suspended there. Next thing we'll do is we'll imagine hanging it from a string. But right now, we've just got this object here. I'll give it a mass. But we want, what is the force on the object? The question mark. Okay, okay. it has its weight. Mg. But there are two forces now, namely the pressure pushing up here and the pressure pushing down there. So aside from Mg, we have two other forces. I'm just going to label them F1 and F2. Like I said, the forces and the sides are canceling. There's nothing going on there. So we have... 
at F2 minus F1. F2 minus F1. And F2, since we're down lower here, is that F2? That is P0 plus rho G H2, the depth of the surface there is a zero. So we subtract off P0 plus rho G H1. Um, and actually I have to multiply both of these to let myself a little more room. So pressure times area minus this times the area. Okay. Pressure times area is force, so this is F2 and this is F1. Okay. Now when we evaluate that, we're going to see pressure minus pressure zero goes away. So what we're left with is here. What we are left with is rho g and there's common A and then there's H2 here minus H1. So that's the force, the, the difference between the one on top and the one on the bottom and that's actually the buoyancy force. Okay. Now, what do we have here? Area times the two height differences is actually the volume of our object. So what we have is for the buoyancy force, it's equal to density G volume. And this requires some careful explanation here. If we write it out in words, it's what's called Archimedes' principle. Archimedes' principle. The buoyancy force is equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. Let's just go ahead and put that down as a, as a statement, force. the weight the displaced fluid is a pretty famous displaced fluid. We'll put it in quotes. Pretty famous statement. Buoyancy force equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. Now what is the weight of the displaced fluid here? It's the mass of the fluid times G. But the mass of the fluid is rho times v. Why is it the displaced fluid? It's because we have a solid object in here, and this is the volume of the fluid that's being taken up by that object. Yeah, so this is crucial. What I'm writing here should be right under this statement of yours up there. but I just want a little more room. It's the same formula, so the buoyancy force, the weight is rho times V times G. And very important, this is not the density of the object, it's the density of the fluid that you're in. Density of the fluid. And this is not necessarily the volume of the object, it's the displaced, so the volume of the fluid displaced. Very important because we could have, we could have a floating object that's half in, half out. And in that case, the displaced volume would just be that part, not the total volume of the object. Okay, so this is Archimedes' principle and we'll be able to solve a couple of really interesting buoyancy problems. At this point, I know I'm going to save it for next time. Let's see where we are here. Yeah, let's go ahead and just put down homework number 31, whatever that may be. Let's have a look. 
Homework 31. So we're now in chapter 9. We've got to look up a couple good problems. Let's consult the book here. Okay, oh yeah, these are some great problems. Yeah, here's what we'll do. Problem one, three, and 89. One, three, 89. Now one of these, actually problem one is just a basic plug in some numbers. The other ones require a little bit of interesting thought. So problem three in particular, let me say something about the weight of the Earth's atmosphere. Okay. So how could we figure out the weight of the entire atmosphere. Remember I said down here, a cubic meter of air is about 1.3 kilograms. But the air gets thinner as we go up, less dense. So the weight of the Earth's atmosphere, this is one of the all time clever arguments actually. So here's our Earth, and it's surrounded by some atmosphere atmosphere here and we know there's pressure always perpendicular now that's how the pressure is exerted always perpendicular to the surface it's on you say the pressure due to a fluid the force due to a fluid is a normal force okay so what's the weight of the earth's atmosphere okay. and in fact are they asking for the weight and then the mass Yeah, well, if you have the weight, you can get the mass as well, okay? So weight is equal to mg, so that would be one idea. I'm using lowercase w, you usually don't do that, but there we go. Weight is equal to mg. It's also a pressure, so it's pressure times area. Force is pressure times area. And in this case, it's the atmospheric pressure. I guess I'm solving this thing. Okay. What's the area but the entire surface area of the Earth? I just said it, but I'm not going to write it down. Okay? It's the entire surface area of the Earth, but I'll give you a give you a hint, the Earth has a radius capital R that we know, so we can get the entire, you know, surface area of the Earth times the atmospheric pressure that we know from down here, and if we were to set that equal to mg, because g is pretty constant up to the levels where the atmosphere is, okay, g is pretty constant, then we would actually get the mass in kilograms of the entire Earth's atmosphere. Okay, that, that's one of those places where you get just an, an amazing result from a very basic calculation. And that's problem three. Okay, good, let's leave it at that. See you guys next time.